Good afternoon, everyone. We are gonna go ahead and begin here. Uh, as we move along, we may have a couple other individuals join us, uh, but I would first off like to welcome you uh, to actually our first ever virtual open house. Um, I know many of you had signed up for a, one of our upcoming open houses, whether it was scheduled for this evening or coming up next week uh, to be here in the building while we were in session. Uh, so I do apologize uh, that that option is right now unavailable. Uh, but my hope is that this virtual open house uh, can give you some further insight and information uh, into our program and services here at Julie Burgett School. Uh, first off, I would like to introduce myself to you. Uh, my name is Jason Weinich. I'm the principal here at Judy Burgess School at the Akron campus. Uh, I have been with the organization for 11 years now. Um, I, had, I was a teacher at the Lindhurst campus, as well as the assistant principal at a Lindhurst campus. And then when we began to open our Akron campus, I came down here uh, for that startup and have been here ever since. Um, joining us this evening is our assistant principal, Gabrielle Vidovian. I'll allow her to take a, a, a brief second here to uh, introduce herself. Hi everyone, I am Gabrielle Vidovian. I am the assistant principal here at Julie Bill. Let me start over, Jason. Yes. Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Gabrielle Rodovian. I am the assistant principal here at Julie Billiard School. This is my third year with um, JB and my first full year as the assistant principal. Um, I am the director of special education. So when we get to IEPs and ETRs, I will be talking to you about how um, JB does that process. Thank you. To, uh, to quick start off, if, we, if you don't mind, if we can take a, a little quick roll call to kind of see who's on the, uh, who's on the uh, open house this evening, um, as well as what grade level you are interested in. Um, so we can kind of just run down the list. I see some names here. So if I, uh, if I shout out your name or a name you may recognize, um, if you wouldn't just wouldn't mind just taking a minute to uh, just introduce yourself by your name and what grade level you are looking at. Um, so I'm going to start with Megan McBearen. Okay, I'm gonna jump to uh, Candace. Hi, I am looking um, interested in the sixth grade. Thank you, Candace. And Tamara Bailey. Yes, hi, um, my name is Tamara Bailey and I'm interested in a third grade. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, Gwen Hughes. Hi, I'm uh, interested in kindergarten. Uh, Welcome, Gwen. Or should I say kindergarten too, huh? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and oh, like Max and Ezra to go to school together? I don't have a name, but uh, you do have your video on uh, with I can, I can it. You by a maroon shirt. There we go. Um, Aaron Bertoft. Oh, hi, Aaron. What grade level are you looking at? Um, looking for my son, and he would be going into second grade in the fall. Oh, very good. Thank you. All right, uh, let's go ahead and begin. Um, thank you for, I believe I got everyone. Let me just double check. Yeah. 
Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I, I'm very sorry that you were unable to be here in the building uh, for this open house this evening. Um, you know, typical procedures is we, you know, would love for you to be uh, here in our environment, uh, part of our, uh, being part of our classrooms. Um, certainly if it's an open house during the day, being able to see our students in action. Um, but my hope is through this presentation that we are able to bring that alive to you as much as we possibly can. Um, so as we go along, I'm gonna be going through a, uh, a number of different slides and giving you a whole slew of different information. Um, and then at the very end, we will go ahead and open it up for any questions. Um, so certainly as we go along, jot down any questions that you might have because we'll certainly have some time to wrap back around to them. Okay, so a little bit of a background about Julie Budget School. Uh, we have been uh, working with students with special needs for over 65 years. Uh, we started at a Lindhurst campus. Uh, that campus has been in operation uh, since the beginning. And then just over, uh, over, well, three years ago, we opened up our Akron campus. But we are a Catholic school uh, rooted in the, uh, the faith base of the, the, the Catholic faith um, and sponsored by the Sisters of Notre Dame. As you can see, our mission up on the screen is certainly to empower and nurture students with special learning needs. Um, our classroom environment is, and our, and our teachers and our population together really work hard to create an experience that allows our students to thrive, allow them to open up opportunities, both from an academic and a social experience. Um, and those are gonna be two core areas that you're gonna hear a lot about this evening uh, in regards to academics and social development. And so you can see we have four core values uh, that we uh, really thrive to in interject into our classrooms on a daily basis. Um, one of them that I would like to point out to you, uh, one of them that is most important to me is that core value of courage. Um, we have many students who transition to us from a, a variety of different settings. And especially for our students who come to us at the first grade on forward, many times they're coming from a, a difficult situation. Uh, and I say difficult because it may have been a difficult experience um, because of lack of academic structure or supports. Uh, maybe social, socially things were difficult for the child, uh, maybe relate, social relationships or peer relationships were a struggle for them. Um, maybe it was the instruction, uh, maybe they didn't have the appropriate instruction for them. And so a lot of our students who come to us on day one uh, experience a lack of courage. And that's part of our job, is to really build up and develop courage within our students. We want them to feel empowered to do their very best inside and outside of the, out of the classroom. And so we do want our students to come into our classroom each and every day saying, I can, I can do this. I can take on this task. I know it's gonna be a struggle for me. I know it's hard, but our goal is to help our students self-advocate for themselves, help them understand what is it that they need to be successful each and every day but we also want them to have the attitude of, I can do it. I can take on this task, I can do it. And so while yes, the other uh, core values such as commitment, collaboration and compassion are all very much part of our setting each and every day, it's that courage piece that plays a huge role in the success that we see all of our students here have at Judy Bay School. I would like to take a, a brief moment to share a little bit about our expansion here into Summit County. Um, since we are a rather new campus, um, we opened our doors for the 2017-2018 school year, uh, just three years ago. And when we did open our doors, we, uh, we opened up the grades kindergarten through second grade. And then each year after that, we had expanded into the upper grades. Last year for the 18-19 school year, we added our third, fourth, and fifth grade uh, levels. And then this year, 
uh, we had opened up our full model, which is kindergarten through eighth grade. Now, a little bit about our environment and our capacities, and that's one thing to, uh, to point out, is we do have capacities within each and every one of our classrooms. Kindergarten through second grade has a capacity of 12 students. Our third through eighth grade uh, classrooms have a capacity of 16 students. So starting at the third grade level, we do bump our numbers up slightly uh, in those upper grades. Um, but uh, it is important to point out that you know, there is that capacity of 12 students in kindergarten through second and 16 in third through eighth grade. And within our building, um, you'll find that there is one class per grade level. Um, that model replicates itself between the Lyndhurst campus and the Akron campus. And we are soon uh, preparing to open up a third campus, which is expected to be on the west side of Cleveland. So we're very excited about all of our expansions and great opportunities to, uh, to meet even you know, a greater number of students and their needs. A little bit about our student body and who is it that we serve. Um, know that the list that you see up on your screen is certainly not an all-inclusive list. Um, this list is just to give you an understanding or an idea of who is it uh, that we serve day in and day out. Um, our student body falls into that more to mild to moderate range of needs. Um, when we talk our, about our environment, you'll notice that we are a small group environment. Uh, we'll get into detail what that looks like, but we are an environment that students come to us because they are going to thrive based on the small environment that we're able to create, as well as the amount of service and supports that we are able to interject into the classroom setting. And so with our student body, many times you'll see uh, moderate to high functioning autism, specific learning disabilities, whether it's a disability in reading, math, or writing. A lot of attention needs, such as ADHD, ADD, as well as anxiety. Students with uh, a diagnosis of dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia. Sensory processing disorders. Um, and beyond that, such as students with possibly a traumatic brain injury that has now caused a specific learning disability. Um, so again, uh, really any reason why a student would thrive uh, in a small group environment, uh, and we know that there is certainly a great capacity to learn for academics and social development. Now to talk about our school environment. We, uh, we just got done talking about our capacities within the classroom setting, but what's really important to note is the, the uh, student to teacher ratio throughout the course of our settings. Now, each of our uh, uh, grade levels are broken down into whole group and small group instruction. Um, and this is very important to note because the instruction looks rather different in both of those settings. For our core academics, reading, writing, math, and word study, those subject areas are always taught in a small group setting. And so that is taught in either a six to one at our younger grades or a, an eight to one uh, student to teacher ratio in our upper grades. And then more of our secondary academics, science, social studies, religion, handwriting, uh, those are often taught as a whole group setting. And so the uh, core group of students at each grade level will come back together and it's a co-taught experience. And so in each of our classrooms, you'll find that each classroom has two intervention specialists as the core teachers for the class. So the kindergarten class will have two intervention specialists. The third grade class will have two intervention specialists. Same thing in the eighth grade class as well. Now, when we uh, break up into our small groups for our core academics, what we do is we work in grade bands. First and second grade is a grade band, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, and seventh and eighth is a grade band as well. And so what we do is, let's take the third and fourth grade class as the example. 
would take the, the pool of the third grade students and the pool of the fourth grade students and combine them. And then what we do is based on the student's instructional level, we break them up into those small groups. We break them up into small groups for reading, writing, math, and word study. And each one of our intervention specialists at that level will take one of those uh, small groups for that instruction. When we come back together for our whole group instruction in science, social studies, and religion, that becomes a co-taught experience. And so all the students come back into the main classroom and they uh, go through their uh, content areas for science, social studies, and religion as a co-taught process. And so we have two teachers working together uh, throughout those lessons. As I uh, mentioned earlier, um, you're gonna hear a lot about academics and then you're gonna hear a lot about social development as well too. Uh, those are our two core emphasis that we, uh, we provide within our setting here at Julie Burgett School. And so let's talk a little bit about the social competencies right now. Um, we have a number of students who join our setting here because of the lack of social development uh, that currently exists. And it's part of our job, part of our responsibilities to build up those social competencies really help our students with those conversational skills. Allow them to develop the skills that are going to help them become uh, a strong group participant within their classroom setting. We wanna teach social competencies so that way they can go outside at recess and have meaningful relationships, join in, in meaningful games, and, and really be able to enhance that aspect of their development. Now, when we go to address the social competencies within our school here, we do that in a number of different facets. Now, one critical uh, individual who plays a huge role within our setting is our speech pathologist. And we have two speech pathologists uh, within our uh, school setting. One who focuses on the younger grade levels, kindergarten through third, uh, to fourth grade, and one who focuses on fifth through eighth grade. Now that speech pathologist uh, is going to provide direct therapy uh, in a small group setting for those students who obviously need articulation needs, uh, expressive receptive uh, needs, as well as social pragmatic skills. Um, so they'll be working with the therapist in that group, uh, small group setting. But that therapist will also go into main classrooms, kindergarten through eighth grade, on a weekly basis to do whole group social lessons with our students. This is a very important piece uh, that we, uh, we have within our setting because it allows our students, especially our students who are working in that direct therapy setting, to come into a whole, uh, a whole group setting and be able to generalize those skills into the classroom. So kindergarten through eighth grade, you can expect that the uh, therapist is going into the classrooms on a weekly basis to do whole group social lessons with the class as a whole. You'll also see the speech pathologist just entering the classroom setting uh, regularly throughout the course of the day too, uh, to help generalize certain skill sets that the students are working on. Another program that we have here at our school is the Lunch Bunch program. Again, it's the speech pathologist working with specific groups of students uh, during their lunchtime to help, again, generalize those skills uh, into that lunch setting, which we know can be more of an unstructured setting. It's very different from the classroom setting. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for students to carry over those skills into that unstructured-like setting. Now, beyond the supports that are provided by the speech pathologists, our intervention specialists also play a huge role in developing social competencies for us students as well. Um, a couple things to point out is that we use a program called a social thinking curriculum as a core program to uh, help enhance uh, a lot of the social skills that our students are working on. We do a lot of social-based problem solving uh, with our students throughout the course of the day. Um, but one of, the, uh, one of the critical elements that I wanna point out is when our students go off into their small group setting for reading, writing, math, and word study, 
yes, it's a great time to work on those academics when you're in close proximity with a, uh, with a teacher and real, you know, being able to maximize those supports. But it's also a perfect time to work on those social development skills as well, too. So now you have the intervention specialist there working with our students from the time that they walk in the door to the time they walk out, addressing those social competencies. And so if the teachers identify throughout the course of the day, oh, hold on, this is an area that we need to work on. This is a moment that we can use, that I can model uh, appropriate social competencies. The intervention specialists are going to do that because we realize that, that you know, our students need that ongoing support throughout the course of their day, uh, especially in this area. Going into the, uh, the services that are offered here at Julie Bennett School, uh, we also, we already talked uh, in depth about the speech therapists um, and their role within our building, as well as the intervention specialists. Um, but to name uh, several other individuals as well, is we do have the occupational therapists on staff uh, here full time, uh, who will work with students on their fine motor skills as well as any sensory needs. Um, and again, she'll work with students in a small group setting, in a direct therapy setting, as well as in the whole group classroom setting to help generalize a lot of skill sets. Uh, she's in ongoing communication with our intervention specialist to develop plans and develop an environment uh, that is certainly very suitable uh, for the child to really help through maybe any sensory needs uh, that need to be, um, that we need to be mindful of uh, during their instruction. Music therapy and also uh, in addition to music therapy, art therapy is part of our setting. Um, unfortunately, through our virtual open house, you have the disadvantage of not meeting our therapy dog, Sydney, um, but uh, Sydney is with us uh, five days a week uh, with our students. She's a great support for our students who have a lot of anxiety um, so you'll often see her in the classrooms uh, supporting different students. As well as school nurse on staff to help administer any medications that need to be administered throughout the course of the day or obviously any of those bumps and bruises that come along with playing on a playground. Um, you know, one important piece to point out uh, that is uh, absolutely critical in our setting is the collaboration that happens. Um, obviously a tremendous amount of collaboration between all of our therapists and our intervention specialists, that is ongoing. But beyond that is really the collaboration that happens between the teachers, the therapists, and the parents. We don't have the success that we do uh, with our students without the involvement of the parents. Um, and so from day one, you'll know that our teachers are very much in support of the ongoing communication that needs to happen uh, in order for us to, to, to really reach the performance that we're looking for uh, with our students. And so throughout all the supports uh, that we have in place, uh, the families are gonna be part of that process, whether there are certain behavior plans that we put in place, academic plans or social plans, um, you're certainly a vital piece in that process um, because oftentimes there's a lot of carryover, carryover that happens at home. Um, we're going to be there to support you in the homework process uh, as well as beyond that. Um, we, you know, we know that the child's with us for six and a half hours of the day, um, but that's not enough. And we want to make sure that our supports, our interventions, our strategies uh, get carried over in the home setting as well. Now to talk about our classroom environment, our physical environment. Um, every grade level, kindergarten through eighth grade, has two workspaces. There's a main classroom and a resource room. And uh, certainly this is one of the, you know, one of the reasons why I would love for you to be here, very inside our buildings, for you to where you have a clear understanding of what this looks like. Um, but every grade level has two classroom spaces. And the students see both of those spaces as their classrooms. 
Now we have our main classroom where all the whole group instruction is, takes place, transitions, daily routines, but then we have our resource room as well. That resource room is a room that is right next door to the main classroom. Oftentimes there's a direct pathway in between the main classroom and the resource room. And that resource room is there because when we go to break up into our small groups, we have one small group stay in the main classroom and another small group that heads over to the resource room. Now the, uh, the supports and the resources in both the main classroom and the resource room replicate itself. And so they have the same technology. It's just that the resource room is a little bit of a smaller workspace because it's intended uh, for a small group environment. Now that resource room also serves as a, as a place for a student who may need a break. Uh, many of our students are on different break plans uh, throughout the course of the day. And they can head over to the resource room uh, to take their breaks, whether it's a sensory break or more of a, uh, just a uh, kind of, I just need a couple minutes before I head back into, uh, into the, the group setting. Uh, it also serves as a, as a place for independent work. Uh, possibly the students may be working in a whole group setting and a student just needs a quiet workspace uh, at that moment. Uh, we have that resource room uh, to serve that, that purpose as well. Um, you'll notice that uh, all of our classrooms have a lot of different alternative workspaces or flexible seating. Um, some of our students, you'll see that they're working at their desk, students are working in bean bags, students are working at standing desks. Um, we are very knowledgeable and accommodating to students' needs and what their body needs to be effective in the classroom setting. One of our ultimate goals is to increase the time on task for our students. And so we want to develop a setting that really expands and enhances their time on task. So whatever we need to do to help regulate their body, we're going to do that uh, because you know, we do want them to maximize the amount of time that they're able to spend on the content areas. Uh, all of our classrooms are technology ready, uh, meaning that each and every one of our main classrooms and resource rooms have what's called an active panel uh, in them. Um, an active panel is a, um, you know, what used to be a, a, what, you know, a smart board, um, but now much more interactive. And it allows for two uh, really main, main things to happen. Uh, allows our teachers to have a visual component to the lesson constantly, but it also allows for a lot of great collaboration uh, between our students as well. Now to, uh, to dig into our curriculum a little bit. Um, I have some examples up here on the screen, uh, but what this is intended to do is to give you an understanding that, you know, as I shared before, when we go to instruct our students in the small groups, they're in small groups and they're in small groups for a reason. Each of those small groups are developed to meet students' needs. And so let's take our third and fourth grade as the example again. So at the third and fourth grade level, you're gonna have four different groups for reading. Each of those reading groups are going to be at a different level. One group is going to be at or above grade level. Another group may be slightly below grade level. Another group may be a grade level to a grade level and a half behind. And then our lowest group is gonna be the group that is in the need of the most remediation. They may be two, three grade levels behind in that academic area. And because we have those groups set up like that, that requires us to have a number of different programs available to our teachers uh, to use within their, uh, within their instruction. So let's go ahead and use reading as the example. Uh, you can see that for reading, we have uh, the Reading Street program, My Sidewalks on Reading Street, as well as the Wilson uh, language program as well. Now, Reading Street would be used for the students who are at or above grade level 
or even slightly below. It's a program that is a little bit quicker pace, has more content built into it, um, and you, you know, the general setup in terms of what's provided visually uh, to the students is a little bit more robust uh, because you know, they certainly have the, the capabilities of handling that type of program. Now for our students who may be a grade level behind or more, they may be using the My Sidewalks on Reading Street program. This program is a much more structured program. It is not as busy uh, from a visual standpoint. It really take us, takes a closer look at core concepts that need to be taught. And then for a group that is our lowest reading group, uh, we are utilizing the Wilson Language Program. Uh, this is the group that needs the most read remediation. And if you know anything about Wilson, Wilson is a very rigorous, uh, very structured um, based program. Um, and so, and that, that carries over across all of our academics, whether it's math, whether it's writing, a number of different programs that we have in place to meet different students' needs. You can see some of our other programs as well um, in regards to our social programming, uh, religion, and science. Um, you know, one thing to point out in regards to our religion instruction, um, religion instruction happens on a daily basis for our students. Uh, we are a Catholic school, uh, but when you take a look at our population of students, it is a strong mixture of a population where we have about 40% of our student body who is Catholic and 60% of our student body who is non-Catholic. And so within our religion instruction, um, we, we want to acknowledge that our, because the, the core emphasis of our, read, our religion instruction centers around who we are as a person really helping develop our students to be strong citizens so that way they can go out into the community and really be uh, a, a strong model for others and so that's certainly a, a core emphasis of our religion instruction that you know also interjects the catholic so uh, the catholic teachings and whatnot To talk a little bit about assessments. Uh, assessments play a, a vital role in what we do each and every day uh, with our students. Um, and that starts at the very beginning, actually even uh, early on in the screening process and carries on as the student enrolls with us and then is an ongoing process as the student continues to be with us uh, through their uh, instruction. Uh, to run through a few of these with you, um, some of the uh, assessments that you would see uh, within our setting, such as the developmental spelling assessment, uh, qualitative reading inventories, or the QRIs uh, to measure fluency and comprehension skill sets. Um, we use what's called the Measures of Academic Progress, or MAP assessments. Um, those assessments play a pretty uh, important role uh, within our setting. We do the MAP assessments three times a year, once in the fall and then in the winter, and then at the conclusion of the school year as well. Uh, the MAP assessment is very impor important to us because um, it, it does a great job of measuring growth. And that's what we're most interested in. Um, we know that many times academics can be a struggle for our students. So when you measure achievement, that tends to be lower. Um, but what we want to know is how are our students growing um, from two uh, points in time? And the MAP assessments does a great job for us uh, in doing that. And we, we utilize that information because it gives us vital information as instructors on what we need to do for the student. So as we take a look at uh, between fall and winter and we identify the type of progress the student has made, if it's uh, lower than what we expected, we can, you know, that allows us to understand what type of adjustments we need to make to strategies, instructions, interventions. Um, and if we see a, a tremendous amount of growth, uh, we're able to report on the strategies and interventions that are most effective uh, for the student. We use uh, the Accelerator Reader Program 
uh, as a comprehension assessment. And then uh, throughout the, the, the weeks and the days of instruction, there's a lot of different curriculum-based uh, formal and informal assessments that us, our teachers use on a daily basis. Now, we already uh, talked quite a bit about the technology that's in the classroom. There's a couple other pieces that I do want to recognize. Um, our students do use Chromebooks uh, within our setting. We do have a one-to-one -one program uh, for our Chromebooks. Um, now, within our setting, you'll, be, you'll see that they're used intentionally uh, for supplemental learning. There's a number of different programs that our teachers use uh, within our setting here. Uh, to help support uh, some of their instruction. And that support can be here at school or the supports can be used at home as well. And some of those examples would be things such as Raz Kids is a program that we use, or uh, Exact Path is another program uh, that we use that's technology based as well. For our older students who are using Chromebooks, uh, Google Classroom is a program that is used pretty heavily in our setting. Um, and I will say even heavier now that we are in distance learning. Um, but for our older students, they are getting themselves really familiar with Google Classroom uh, because we know that it's a, that's a platform that is heavily utilized in the high school setting. Uh, so we do uh, help our students uh, become familiar with that uh, platform and begin using it in our setting for their instruction, uh, for submitting assignments, and participating in classroom uh, online discussions. We also have a number of different iPads uh, throughout our environment as well uh, for, um, as a support system in our classrooms. Uh, to go a little bit beyond uh, the classroom, the curriculum, um, a couple other uh, elements that I want to talk with you about is music therapy, art therapy, and gym. Uh, three aspects that all of our students participate on in on a weekly basis. Um, our students participate in music therapy as a whole group. Uh, so each class uh, goes to music therapy. Uh, Kate Sonnenberg is our music therapist, and she is actually a shared uh, therapist between our setting here in Akron and the Lyndhurst campus. Uh, for art therapy, uh, Mrs. Hattie Queen is our art therapist. Um, and she really has two uh, different types of environments in our setting. All of our classes go to art therapy as a whole group on a weekly basis. And then she does art therapy with individual students as well. And so that, that, in, that art therapy for individual students is there for uh, as a support system. So maybe a student is struggling for a, you know, many different reasons. Maybe there's something happening at home and they're having a hard time coping with that situation. Maybe peer relationships is a little bit of a struggle and from an emotional side, we need to provide a little additional support. Um, many, many different reasons why a student would go to art therapy uh, on an individual basis, um, but know that that support is there and it's a, a very important piece uh, that can be very supportive of a lot of our students. Uh, as, and then gym, um, students participate in gym class twice a week. Um, really, you know, we do put a lot, of, a lot of emphasis, again, on our social development uh, within, within gym class, focusing on group participation, um, as well as expanding interests. Okay, now we're uh, heading over into the special education processes and I'm going to turn it over to Gabrielle to share a little bit on that. All right, so with IEPs, we work with your home school district of residence. So wherever you live is who would be responsible for writing the IEPs. And here at JB, our staff will write um, a document and they write it at least um, about a month and a half before your child's IEP expires. And so um, at that point, I am in contact with your homeschool district of residence school 
and we set up, um, they will contact you and set up an IEP meeting and then I will send them the document we, we have created here at JB. So our intervention specialists, our speech pathologist, and our occupational therapist um, come together and write this document. And in this document, you would find the um, profile, which talks about all your child's strengths, weaknesses, um, ETR data, their MAP scores, um, and then our OT and our speech will write a little um, section in each of that profile section about what they have been working on. And then we also um, write the present levels, goals and objectives, which are almost exactly similar to how they are done for the regular uh, documents for the public schools. And then we also do accommodations. And so then our hope is that the um, public schools take everything that we've provided to them, which um, I have not had a problem over the last year and a half with schools having issues with what we've written. Um, a lot of the schools are actually grateful for what we provide because our intervention specialists um, are working with our students every day. They are those main teachers. So they can really specify what these children need to work on um, in the classroom. So then um, the homeschool district would contact you and then I would attend the IEP meeting with you at your homeschool district. Um, and our teachers collect data and report on ODE every nine weeks. And then um, as for the ETRs, um, Akron Public Schools, which is our um, district of service here because our school is located in Akron, um, they have a team that comes out here and works with, our, with your child if they are up for their um, renewal, which happens every three years. So at that point, um, the school psychologist, occupational therapist, speech pathologist come and work with your child um, in one of our rooms, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, and they might do some um, in-class observations too. And then we would, after they've collected all the data, we, um, the parents and myself, go down to Akron and we have the ETR meeting down at Akron Public Schools there. Um, main building down there. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, the, uh, the second part of this is about being a scholarship provider. And uh, you may or may not be aware of two scholarships that are provided through the state of Ohio. And that is the John Peterson Scholarship and the Autism Scholarship. Um, these are two important scholarships that help uh, uh, cover the cost of tuition. Um, so to run through um, a couple of these, and I, I know we're going to come back to another slide that talks a little bit more about the scholarships too, um, but know that in regards to the autism scholarship, that scholarship is there for any student that has the category of disability as, as autism listed under evaluation. The John Peterson Scholarship, it's another scholarship that is there for students who qualify for special education services. But you're going to use, this, uh, use the John Peterson Scholarship if your child has any other category of disability other than autism. So it may be other health impairment, specific learning disability, traumatic brain injury, intellectual disability. Um, there's a number of different uh, categories. Uh, just know that the John Peterson Scholarship covers all the categories, and then the autism scholarship only covers the category of autism. Uh, we'll come back a little bit uh, to those in a second. At this moment, I want to just talk through a couple basic logistical items about our school operations. Um, one, starting with our school times. We start at 8 o'clock and end at 2.45 with our students. Know that our doors open at 7.40. And so between 7.40 and 8 o'clock, our students have a choice between our walking club and our quiet zone, where students kind of just quietly read and wait for the day to start. Uh, but they have those two options when they come in in the morning. And then our dismissal starts at 2.45. And then at 3 o'clock, uh, we do have an aftercare program that is available that runs from three to six. And we have families who use aftercare on a daily basis, and we have families who use aftercare very sporadically. 
Um, even if, you know, day of, if you know that, you know, I'm not going to be able to get there till 4.30, uh, you can certainly just notify us and know that your child is going to be able to, go, going to, be able to go to aftercare uh, while uh, they wait for, for you to come pick them up. Um, know that aftercare is a extension of the school day in many ways. It's a structured program. Uh, they have a set schedule uh, that they follow in aftercare. Um, so it really helps uh, with the students, uh, you know, transition from their school day to aftercare. Uh, there's opportunities for them to do homework. There's opportunities for them to do uh, quiet activities. There's opportunities for them to do physical activities as well too, all based on their schedule. We are a uniform-based school, uh, so you, students do wear uniforms uh, throughout the course of the week. Uh, we go through our school store via Land's End for those uniforms. Um, and then we also have spirit wear as well. Uh, typically, throughout the course of the week, students wear uniforms Monday through Thursday. And then Friday is typically a dress down day. Um, could be a casual dress down day, could be a spirit wear dress down, dress down day, or um, coordinating with, you know, um, a holiday such as St. Patrick's Day where we may be dressing down in green. Um, and so we develop a schedule for all those dress down days at the start of the year. For lunches, students pack their lunches each and every day. It's a packed lunch program. Um, but we do do special hot lunches uh, throughout the course of the month as well. Um, our hot lunches are a, uh, a scheduled hot lunch where they may be a pizza or a pasta hot lunch. Um, but also throughout the course of the year, we do invite other organizations uh, to provide special lunches for our students. Um, sometimes you may see a Chipotle hot lunch. Um, there could be um, uh, other organizations, um, such as uh, like a, a, a local deli, uh, who may provide a hot lunch to us as well. Um, so know that those options are, are there for students. They do not have to participate, but uh, certainly the options are there. We certainly just like to break it up a little bit and uh, change it up for the students. And then throughout the course of the year, there's a number of different after-school program options as well. Um, such as this year, we had our cross-country team uh, that ran in the fall. Uh, we have had a program called Snapology, which is a Lego building uh, program. Uh, we have our running club uh, and our um, Believe in Me race uh, that, that happens at the conclusion of the school year. So throughout the course of the year, uh, there are many different options uh, for your child to participate in after school. All right, well, a couple last pieces of information that I would like to share with you today. Um, one being the application process. Um, our applications are online. Uh, you would visit our school website listed on the screen here. And from there, you will be able to access our online applications. That's the first part. Uh, we ask our families to fill out those online applications and submit all the supporting documents, such as the IEP and ETR documents. Um, and then from there, uh, the administration does a pre-screening. We go ahead and take a look at the application as well as the IEP and ETR um, to see if there's any initial questions that we may have for you. Um, the next uh, piece is the screening or the shadow day. Um, for our uh, kindergartners, uh, we'll do a screening here. Uh, for our first through eighth graders, it's a shadow day experience. Now, um, you know, due to our current, uh, you know, situation with the, the coronavirus pandemic, obviously uh, that has put a little bit of a halt on our shadow days, um, which is nothing to be concerned about. It just unfortunately uh, delays our process just a little bit. Um, we are hopeful uh, that we will be able to, you know, start school back up here very soon. And as soon as we do start up, those shadow days will be uh, will start up as well. Um, kindergarten for kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, now, in the event, and you know, I bring this up because I know it's been talked about uh, from a national standpoint. In the event that school is closed for the remainder of the school year, um, certainly we will continue to follow 
uh, the protocols that are put in place by the government in terms of what businesses are allowed to be open and whatnot. Uh, but in the event that schools would be closed for the remainder of the school year, you can expect that we will be conducting screenings for all of our applicants as soon as we can. And that means as soon as businesses are allowed to be uh, functioning again, um, and whether that's in May or whether that's the beginning of summer, uh, we, we don't know as of yet. Um, please don't let that uh, prevent you from uh, providing your application um, because as I mentioned before, uh, we do have capacities uh, in each of our classrooms. And once we're at a capacity, we will be building a wait, a wait list of applications uh, in case you know, a student moves or there's an opening that opens up in the classroom. Once that screening or shadow day is completed, uh, we'll go through the acceptance. Uh, we'll be notifying you, uh, we'll review that screening process with you, go over all of our outcomes, and then give our recommendations for proceeding with enrollment. Uh, if you know, we feel that it is a good fit for your child and we do want to proceed with enrollment, um, we'll set up what's called an acceptance meeting where we'll provide you with all the enrollment paperwork and get you started um, for the school year. Now, if you are utilizing the Autism Scholarship, uh, know that that scholarship has a, uh, a total allotment of $27,000. Our tuition for next school year is actually $27,540. Um, so the Autism Scholarship does cover the majority of that tuition. If you are using the John Peterson Scholarship, uh, that scholarship works a little bit different. Uh, there are different amounts allotted to different categories of disabilities. So I'm gonna use the example of specific learning disability. If your child has a category of specific learning disability, they are going to receive an amount of $10,025 through that scholarship. Now, our families who participate in the John Peterson Scholarship, they also participate in our financial, uh, our financial aid as well. And so when we recognize that your student would be a candidate uh, for the John Peterson Scholarship, and we determine that through the ETR that you send us, um, we would provide you with that financial aid application, uh, so that way you can proceed with that application process as well. Um, for our financial aid, we have a financial aid committee who reviews all those applications and provides those awards. And those awards are based on a, a pool of funding uh, that is provided for students who are in need of additional aid. And then regarding the Autism and John Peterson Scholarship, we obviously have talked a little bit about them already. Um, the one piece that we did not talk about yet is how and when do I apply? You apply for those scholarships when you have decided on your provider or school. So as you go through the application process and uh, it's been deemed that it's a good fit for your child, at that point in time, that's when you're going to apply for the either Autism or John Peterson Scholarship. Um, the, uh, the application uh, process begins April 1st uh, for the next scholarship year. And so uh, we'll, be start submit, you know, we'll start submitting those applications beginning April 1st and that will be ongoing. Uh, one important piece of information to know is that the scholarship year goes from July 1st to June 30th. And so anyone applying for the scholarship after July 1st, that amount for the scholarship begins to be prorated every day after July 1st. Um, but anyone who applies for the scholarship from uh, April to June 30th, you would be eligible for the, uh, the full amount. And uh, the last piece for that scholarship is, you know, that's a scholarship uh, that you apply for, but it's not like a, a wait and see if we get this. Um, as long as you met the criteria, which is, does my child qualify for special education services? Yes, if the answer is yes. And does my child have an IEP? 
And if the answer is yes, then your child will receive the scholarship. Okay. Well, that brings us to the, uh, the conclusion of the presentation piece of this. Um, you know, before I, uh, you know, start answering any questions, because certainly you're, you're welcome to jump off at, at uh, jump off of this meeting at any point in time. But I do want to thank everyone uh, for joining in today. I hope uh, this presentation provided you with a little bit of an insight, uh, an overview of our services here at Judy Bayer School. I do encourage you to uh, go through that application process um, as we are moving along, even with the, the current standstill that we have with our nation's pandemic. Um, that's not stopping our processes. Uh, we're, we'll continue to move along. Um, so I, I do encourage you to do so. Um, but, but again, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. If there's any questions after today, feel free to contact me. Um, my contact information is all over our, our website. Uh, feel free to email me, feel free to call me, and we can certainly uh, work through any questions that you might have. Um, I'm certainly gonna hang out here uh, for uh, a little while. Uh, so I can hand answer any questions that you might have right now. But thank you. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, this, this is Aaron Bertoft. Hi, Aaron. Hi. Um, do students um, at Julie Billiard take the OSTs? Do they take the Ohio State testing? So, good question. So, yes and no. <laughs> and I'll tell you why yes and no. Okay. For our students who are participating in the John Peterson Scholarship, that is a requirement for the renewal of the scholarship. Now, for our students who are on the Autism Scholarship, um, they are exempt from taking the statewide assessment. But if you're on a John Peterson scholarship, it is a requirement, um, and we do work through that process. Um, we know it can be a very tedious process, but we try to alleviate as much stress as possible and walk our students through that. And we certainly do break it up into small uh, sections to make it a, a much more feasible uh, opportunity for our students. Um, okay, that sounds good. Um, is the school nurse a nurse or a medical assistant? So we, there's two individuals. Um, and so the, uh, we have a health aide uh, that is on staff on a daily basis. Okay. And so the health aide is obviously um, has all the appropriate training for any sort of medication administrations or uh, addressing any um, wounds or uh, anything that may occur. Um, in regards to a registered nurse, we have a registered nurse who works hand in hand with our health aide. The registered nurse is not on premise on a daily basis, but she is at the hands of the health aide at any point in time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are the students ever in the resource room by themselves or is it always with a, a teacher? Mm -hmm. um, so get a little bit different based on grade level. Okay. Um, obviously as you get up into the middle school, things right. are a little bit different. Right. Um, but generally in our, in our lower grade levels, yes, you know, the teachers are going to be with the students in those resource rooms. Okay. Now, I, Unfortunately, with you not being here, it's a little hard to envision what that completely looks like. Yeah. But a lot of our classrooms have a doorway that goes from our main classroom into the resource room. Okay. It's not the case for all of our classrooms. Some of them you do walk out into the hallway, uh, right around into the resource room. Um, so it, it differs a little bit based on grade level. Um, but for our, for our younger grade levels, yes. If, uh, if a student is in the resource room, yes, you're gonna see a teacher in there as well. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, PE, you said, was twice a week. Is art and music once per week? Yeah, art and music therapy is once a week for the whole class. Okay. Um, 
Um, the OT does, my son has, um, currently his IEP is just written for OT consult, not direct services, but um, current school thinks that he would benefit from direct services. But I'm just wondering if, 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 he, ha if he went without that on his IEP, would the OT, do, does the OT ever work with like the whole group or is it just the students that they provide direct services for? Yeah, I'm gonna let Gabrielle uh, okay. share a little bit about this because this is uh, a, a, common, uh, a common situation for some families. Okay. All right, to answer your first question, if you felt like your son needed um, direct services, what we would do at the beginning of the year, even with um, our intervention specialist, um, they go, these um, occupational therapists will go through every child's IEP to determine who has direct minutes, who has consult. And then from there, um, if our intervention specialists are feeling like, hey, this child really needs direct services, um, that's actually a very easy fix on our end. We do something called a modification form, and it looks very similar to um, an IEP goals and objectives. So okay. that you would write um, where the present level is that your child is currently at, write a goal for him, write objectives. We sign off on it, which would be myself, you, and then we upload it onto ODE, and that then your son would get direct minutes here. Um, okay. Um, she does, now this goes on to your second question. She does direct services in either one-on-one -on -one or small group. She has a classroom upstairs. Okay. Building, but she also does um, some whole group depending on the grade. You're not going to see her as much whole group in the older grades as you would in the younger grades. Right. Um, here she did um, a writing process with our kindergarten, whole class kindergarten class. So she was in the classroom one day a week um, working on just the writing process with them outside okay. of their direct minutes. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. This is Gwen Hughes. I have a question about your younger grades. So the ratio is 12 to 1. Are there additional aides in the room? And if so, what's their, what's their background? Yeah, so for the younger grades, kindergarten through second, the ratio is actually 12 to 2. Um, and so there are two intervention specialists, or so special education teachers in the classroom um, for those 12 students. Um, so in our classroom, our, our model doesn't have any additional aids in the classroom. All of our professionals are the intervention specialists. So kindergarten through second grade does have a 12 to 2 ratio. Gotcha. Thank you. I apologize if I may have mentioned 12 to 1. It's supposed no, I think that's me. Yeah. I have one other question that I thought of. Um, I, my son does not have a diagnosis of dyslexia. Um, he does have an IEP in, in reading, writing, and math already, but he's going to be specifically tested in that area this summer. Um, if, so he would be going into second grade. If he, if he did get, um, that diagnosis of dyslexia, is the Wilson reading program ever available to second grade students or does that only start in third? It starts in third grade uh, in our setting. And so kindergarten, first and second grade, we use Wilson's foundations. Oh. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, yeah, okay. I'm, a, I'm actually a first grade teacher, so I... Perfect. <clears throat> so we use foundations with our K through second grade. Okay. And then in that transition to third grade, that's when we go ahead and make the determinations who are our candidates for Wilson. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, again, thank you very much for being us, uh, with us this evening. Uh, again, any questions that may pop up, feel free to give me a call or email me.
Thank and there's you. one more. Do you guys bus? Do you work with uh, any of the districts to bus students? Uh, so we do not have any transportation uh, that is part of our organization, meaning that we do not provide any transportation. Um, but I will say this, uh, just like any other parochial or private school, uh, your local school district may provide transportation to the school. Okay. Now, your local school district is going to have certain criteria that they're going to look for you to meet such as, you know, you have to be within maybe a 30 minute drive time um, from the school. Um, those criteria is based on the district. So my recommendation would be to contact your transportation department of your local school district and say, you know, uh, we're considering uh, going to uh, Julie <coughs> School uh, this upcoming year. Uh, would transportation uh, be a possibility? And open up that conversation with the transportation department, uh, because I will say every district is different. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you everyone.